People are here. <laughs> Right. Okay, first of all, can you hear me? Can you just tell me if you can hear me or not? Just, you'll have to write it in a message. Can you hear me? Hello. You can hear me, yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> I just thank you. I didn't want to start waffling away <laughs> and then find that no one can hear me. Um, yeah, excellent. Okay, so hi. Um, how's everyone doing? Um, I have had a bit of a funny sort of 24 hours. Uh, last night, obviously, when we all watched the announcement from Boris, at half eight, I have to admit, I got myself in a bit of a state. So, oh, good. <laughs> good. Thanks, Debbie. So, um, yeah, I, I was quite upset because we've had to cancel off our dog walking, which is just, it's the first time we've ever had to do anything like that. So I've been doing dog walking now for 12 years and I've been out dog walking every day for 12 years. Um, so obviously I know I'm still allowed to walk Joey. I'm going to carry on doing that, but it's sad that we can't be walking our clients' dogs and we can't see them. And I know all of my brilliant dog walking staff are going to really miss them as well. And everyone's going to feel really cooped up as well because we're used to being out and about all day. So yeah, really sad last night. Um, today feeling a bit better. Had a really nice sunny walk. Obviously the weather's glorious at the moment, which makes it a million times better, doesn't it? Um, if it was chucking it down with rain, I don't think that would be helping at all. So I had a really nice sunny walk with Joey um, and there was birds and frog spawn. And yeah, it was, hi, Helen. Hello. Uh, yeah, so it was so it was really, really nice. So I'm going to do the plan for, I know, Debbie, we are. We're going to, yeah, especially the puppies, because obviously if we're not seeing your puppies for a while, they're going to change so much in a few weeks as well. Um, that makes it really, really difficult. But anyway, coming back to coming back to this afternoon. So I, I thought this would be a nice thing to do. Uh, there's obviously I'm really limited by the amount of stuff that I can actually be offering because I can't be coming out to see you. I can't be teaching classes anymore. So I'm trying to be creative about what I can do and how I can still help people because my sort of big worry is that when we come out on the other side of this, there's going to be loads and loads of problem dogs. So there's going to be dogs that have got separation anxiety because they're used to their owners being at home all day. Uh, there's going to be dogs that maybe are really fearful because they've not been going out and about and socialising. Um, or there's just dogs that you've not done any training with. So when they do go out into the big wide world, they're totally distracted um, and not listening to you at all. So I don't want that to be the case. So I'm trying to put together some resources of things that we can use to make sure that we have got things uh, that we can be doing uh, whilst whilst we're at home with our with our dogs. Yeah, I know it's tough, isn't it? It's tough. Um, so obviously, from my point of view, um, I've got Joey who is asleep somewhere because he's had a walk and he's had his tea and that's all he needs. So he's going to be 15 in July. So he's an old man. He doesn't remotely care about self-isolation at all. He's happy with his one walk a day. If we did have to go into full lockdown, he would probably be happy with a with a garden, a garden visit as well, to be honest. So I'm, I'm really lucky in that sense that I haven't got a young puppy. But a lot of you have got puppies and obviously this wasn't planned for. We, we didn't know this was going to happen. So you were booked onto courses. You were following socialisation programmes and you've not been able to do what you've wanted to do. So hopefully I'm going to be able to help out with that. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of chat about a topic and then I'm going to make some resources available to you. So we'll have some um, handouts and I'm putting together some videos as well that, that you can use. But I'll talk about that more at the end. If there's anything in particular that you would like me to talk about, if there's anything that I'm not covering or you've got anything that's a really big worry or concern at the moment, either kind of let me know now, you know, uh, drop a note on the group or... 
uh, put a message in the group, that's fine because I'm, you know, I'm going to try and do this every day for at least the next week. So, I, you know, I need ideas. So we're going to start off today. We're going to talk about how to keep our puppies and our dogs busy at home. So I didn't really want to do one that was just puppy specific to start off with. So this is for puppies and older dogs as well. With tiny puppies, it's not such a big issue, especially if you're really monitoring their exercise at this stage. Whereas if you've got older puppies where they're used to going out a couple of times a day or they're used to having a couple of hours exercise a day, it's going to be really hard for them that we're, that we're cutting back on that. Um, so we need to try and think of other ways of tiring them out as well. And there's always other ways to tire our puppies out apart from apart from walks. So obviously walks are really important, but there's other things that we can do them as well. So I've put together uh, three kind of ideas for you to do. And some of them are going to involve you doing stuff with your dogs. And some of them are going to be a little bit more independent. So you can let your dogs get on with them while you're working from home or just, you know, doing homeschooling with the kids, which I'm having to do with Thomas or whatever it is that you're doing. So three sort of main activities. And I think if you can try and include all of these, these three every day, then your dogs or your puppies aren't, they're not going to be missing out at all. They're still going to have plenty to do basically. Okay. So I'll kind of run through them. As I say, if you've got any questions, just um, write them in the box. That's absolutely fine. Okay. Shall we go? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So first one, which I imagine everyone would probably guess, well, anyone who's spoken to me before or met me, is making your mealtimes into activities. So even if your dog or your puppy is only on two meals a day or one meal a day, I would probably try maybe splitting them down to three meals a day. Thanks, Debbie. Um, even if it's, you know, a, a big morning meal and a big evening meal and then just a tiny little lunchtime snack just so that there's three times a day when they've got a mealtime activity and if it's just a snack at lunchtime it'll be easy enough to drop it back down uh, when when we all get back to normal again so i want you to make all of your dog's meals into activities so that means not using the food bowl at all when we're feeding our dogs if we're feeding them from the food bowl it's gone in seconds isn't it especially if you've got a labrador like i have the food bowls there you put it down and it, and it just disappears so on, a, on the one hand, we want to slow them down because it's not really good for them to be inhaling their food because they can take in a lot of air at the same time, which isn't good for them. But also it means that a part of the day which they really enjoy is over quickly and it's, it's gone without them having to really do any work or, or think about it or anything like that. So what we want to do is we want to get them working for their food by planning food activities so there's a few different ways that we can do this and I would maybe try and do a different one each day but if you can't do that that's fine. So first off easiest one is to use something like a Kong or a Canine Connectable something similar to that that's like a food type activity toy. So if you've not come across them already which I'm sure you have your Kong toys are the little red toys with the cavity in that you fill with food and there's canine connectables which have got little ridges and grooves in that you can fill with food as well so if you're feeding them like a wet food or a raw food that goes in quite nicely if you're feeding a dry complete food like i do with joey what you'll need to do is mix it with something sticky so it all sticks together so what i normally do is i get a bowl pour in the biscuits you know the measurement of the biscuits then mix it with something like a little bit of peanut butter or cheese spread or yogurt mix that up first of all and then I'll put it in the con and what that does is it just slows them down with eating so when they're trying to get the food out of the con it's all stuck together and it's all sticky so it's going to end up taking them um, a lot longer to get into the food so that's going to slow them down it's going to turn that meal time into an activity for them it's going to keep them busy as well if you need to be doing something so I always recommend timing things like a Kong toy when you've got to be doing something else. So as I said before, if you're having to do any like homeschooling or if you're cooking uh, or if you're eating or something like that. Hi, Dawn. Uh, that's a good time to be giving them a Kong. And there's loads of similar ones available. You can get them on Amazon if you've not got them already while they're still doing deliveries. So if you've not got one already, then maybe get one. Um, one or two for you know to keep us going over the over the next few weeks they're really sturdy as well and 
I always put mine in the dishwasher and they seem to kind of, hi, uh, they seem to clean them really well in the dishwasher. It doesn't seem to damage them at all either. Canine connectables are really good. They're the ones that you can um, screw together. So I've got a couple of videos that I'm going to show you for those. So I'll, I'll show you where to access those when we, when we finish off this session. So that's going to be one way of making your meal times more interesting. So feed one of your meals as an activity toy like a Kong or a canine connectable and that will keep them going. Some puppies, it will take them longer than others. Joey got very, very good at doing at demolishing a Kong, but some puppies, I've, I've known people that their puppies will take sort of half an hour to 45 minutes to, to finish off their Kong. So that's a brilliant way of, of keeping them busy and it tires them out as well because they're having to work for it. So it's not tiring them out in the physical way like exercises, but mentally it's tiring them out. And that's what we're really going to be focusing on while they're cooped up at home. So that's the first one. Uh, second one is to make an activity toy at home. And this is actually quite a nice one to do with kids. If you've got kids stuck at home, you could maybe do this with them as a bit of an activity. So what you need to do is you need to go into your brown bin and see what's in there that you can make into a toy. So things that work really well are cardboard boxes, uh, plastic bottles, things like that. Um, if it's cardboard and paper and stuff like that, that's that's going to be fairly safe you obviously just need to make sure there's no sharp staples or any tape that they're going to eat um, on top of it toilet tubes so the inner rolls from toilet tubes they're a good one yes crafts <laughs> they're a really good one as well uh, and you can fold over one end of the toilet roll tube put your put your dog's food in it and then fold over the other end and then they've got to either open it or rip it open uh, in order to get the food out and what I like to do when they get good at it, <laughs> what I like to do when, I, when our dogs get good at it is I'll do like one in another one. So I'll do like a couple of toilet rolls and they'll go in a small box and that'll go in a bigger box and that'll go in a bigger box. So make sure that you're saving anything that you think, oh, that looks like a good activity toy, which is what we end up doing. And then we end up having boxes all over the place, but they're there then, aren't they? So it's, it's sniffing things out. Again, that's going to work for them. And I know it's going to be messy if, the weather's nice you could get them to do it in the garden uh, if it's not so good you might have to do it indoors but it's messy but they're chewing something that it doesn't matter that they're chewing and especially for our young puppies that's going to be really important we're giving them an opportunity we're saying right you know we don't want you chewing the table legs or us but here you know rip into this cardboard box this is your opportunity to chew um, I got a delivery before and um, on Friday night I got a bit carried away and ordered a really nice um, like a calming candle. I love a candle. And it smells really nice. Like lavender and things like that. Delicious. Yes. So the packaging that this came in, let me just show you, would be perfect for an activity toy. So it's all cardboard and paper and things like that. So I've got... Ooh. Oh, wobbly, wobbly, wobbly. Lost it. Hi, Catherine. So I've got some tissue paper that came in this package. There's obviously a cardboard box, a bit more cardboard there. And then look at this. How good is that? That is perfect for an activity toy. So I think that's going to be Joey's. Um, yes, Dawn. That's probably going to be Joey's uh, mealtime activity tomorrow because, because he's older. He won't really eat these bits. And to be honest, they're tiny little bits of paper. So even if he eats a little tiny bit of that, it's not, you know, it's not really going to do him any harm. So something like this with all your packaging is absolutely perfect. So that can be one of your activities. The one thing I would say if you're doing that kind of activity is that needs to be supervised. So with your Kongs and your canine connectables, they're designed to be really tough. They're designed to be sturdy. So you can afford to give them those while you're then doing something else. With something like a cardboard box or a plastic bottle, you need to be watching them. You need to be focusing on them just in case they do start trying to chew and eat lots of it, basically. Hi, Hannah. So, yeah, if they eat a little bit, I wouldn't worry too much. You just don't want them eating a lot because obviously we don't want to be having to take our dogs to the vets. And I know a lot of the vets are on sort of limited 
uh, openings at the moment as well. So little tiny bits of paper and cardboard, probably fine. Bigger bits, not. And obviously no plastic or anything like that. So yeah, cardboard boxes. And then what you would do is you would just hide the little bits and pieces in the box. So you, again, with your dry food or it could just be treats, you just hide them in among all the different bits of scrunched up paper and toilet rolls and things like that. And then they've got to sniff them to get them out. And as I say, yes, it's messy, but they're destroying something that it doesn't matter about instead of something that it does matter about. So that's another one of your meals. So we've got um, Congo activity toy and then we've got the um, like an activity out of a cardboard box as well. So that's a really good one to do. And then the last one, which again, you can be involved with, but you don't have to be involved with, is a bit of scent work. And you could do that in the garden if you've got space or you can do it indoors as well. And at its easiest, it is literally just taking a handful of their food. Hi, Hannah. Taking a handful of their food and just chucking it for them to find. So it works quite well on a lawn because it doesn't matter if they're, you know, getting their slobber everywhere, if, you know, if it's on the lawn. Sometimes you have to help them to start off with. So some dogs are really good at this. Labradors are really good at this, obviously, because they love their food. Uh, some dogs take a little bit longer, so you might need to help them. So just gen generally kind of showing them and pointing them where the bits of food are for them to find. And what I'll probably do as well is I'll put a cue word with it. So I'll say find it as I'm pointing. And what they'll do then is they'll learn that when I say find it, that means there's something to sniff for. And you'll notice they kind of change. So they go from looking for it to sniffing for it. And when they do that, you can hear them sniffing really loudly. They go from they're looking and then they, their nose switches on and they go to sniffing for it. And that's when they're starting to do the scent work. And that's what you want them to do. So as I say, the lawn's a good place to do it. You could just do it on the kitchen floor. And to make it easy, keep them sort of within sight. If they get good at it, you can make it harder and hide them. So you could keep them in one room with somebody while you put their food in a different room to go and find. And that's going to take them a good while then to find those biscuits. You can make it harder as they get better at it. If you don't feed your dog a dry food, what you could do instead is you could do the same thing, but you could do it with your activity toys. So if you feed them a raw or a wet food, you could get a couple of small Kongs or um, kind of similar activity toys. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, and you could hide them. So you could have a couple of couple of Kongs filled with your raw and hide them in different places. It's the same thing. We're wanting to, we're encouraging them to sniff out things. So sniffing things, even though physically it is a little bit of exercise, but it's not a lot of exercise. It's more mentally challenging for them. And um, I read in a book about scent work that 20 minutes scent work is equivalent to roughly about an hour's walk. So it's well worth doing some scent work with them. It's really going to tire them out. If you think about like police dogs, like Springer Spaniels and things like that, that sniff out drugs, they'll have these lovely kind of secure kennels in the backs of the vans and they'll let them do sort of 15 minutes, 10 minutes of working and then they'll put them in for a good half an hour, 45 minutes just to rest because they really need to have a break afterwards. The other thing that you'll notice as well after scent work is they get really thirsty. Yes, I know it's a good one. Yes. Um, Yes, we do need tired dogs. <laughs> tired dogs are happy dogs. The other thing that you'll notice is they'll be really thirsty after they've done any scent work as well. So make sure you've got fresh water. I know you will do anyway, but make sure you've got fresh water available. So there you, you sort of your three activities. So you can split your food for the day into three different meals. So you, you've got breakfast, lunch and tea. And then mix and match through the day. You've got one activity, which is something like a conch or an activity toy. One activity, which is just your cardboard box, your homemade activity cardboard box. And one activity, which is your scent work. So combine those three exercises. That's probably going to keep your dog or your puppy occupied for uh, over an hour every day. That's already taking place of sort of an hour's activity or an hour's exercise. And that's just by turning their meals into an activity. Okay. So that's the first, my first tip. So meal times, make your meal times count. My second tip is uh, making your walks count. So if you are still able to walk your dog, this is going to work really well. If you're not able to walk your dog, this would still work in like a garden or a yard or some outside space. So this is kind of more geared to if you're still able to do your once a day exercise, which fingers crossed we're going to be able to keep doing. So what we want to do is we want to make the most of a walk. Rather than it just being 
they go for a walk, we're at the end of the lead, they're off doing their own thing and they're not necessarily registering with us, they're not necessarily checking in with us, they're just there, head down, sniffing, looking for the dogs, looking for the people, doing their own thing, we may as well not exist. That's not going to tie them out as much as a walk with lots of activities and lots of different things going on. And also for those younger puppies, what we need to be doing with our walks is really prioritising socialisation as well. So we're going to be a bit more limited about what we can do with socialisation with our puppies. And that's something that I'm going to talk about probably tomorrow because I really want to get you all started on your socialisation as well, even if you're stuck at home. But your walks, I would be thinking about walks where you can expose them to different things, uh, even if it means popping them in the car and driving them down the road so you're taking in sort of a slightly different area where, where you're walking them. And you can still keep away from everyone, you can still avoid everyone, but it just means that your, your puppy's getting used to seeing lots of different things. As I say, I'll come back to that. So on your walks, I want you to make sure that you're including different activities there. They've not really given us a time limit, have they, for walks? They've just said, you know, you can go out and do your daily exercise. And for most of us, that daily exercise means taking our dog for a walk, doesn't it? Um, I read something today, actually, which mentioned that if there's two people in the house, you could both walk them separately. Um, So one of you could go for a half an hour walk in the morning and then another one could go for a half an hour walk in the afternoon. So even though the people are only going out once a day, the dog's actually getting to go out twice a day. And I thought that was a really good point. So if you've got multiple people in the house that can walk your dog, more people can actually be taking them out. So your dog might actually get away with more than one walk a day. Um, If they are only getting one walk a day, obviously you might want to make it a little bit longer Uh, an hour per person okay yeah so if you've got two people in the family they could have two good hours of walk couldn't they you'd be fine then (laughs) um so yeah half an hour okay yeah splitting it yeah so half an hour to an hour for your walk and what i want you to do is on your walk i want you to try and incorporate three different things i want you to incorporate some training uh, some playing and some scent work again. So I've included scent work again here just because it is so effective at tiring them out and it's a nice easy one to do on a walk. So training wise, it would just be putting in some really simple little exercises. So things like getting them to sit before you cross the road or you could get them to sit around distractions. Like if they see another dog going past or a bird flying past, ask them to sit then. So you're just checking in with them regularly. You're reminding them that you're there and you're reminding them that it's worth paying attention to you and listening to you. For those of you that haven't really worked with me before, um, I always use um, treats and rewards for my training. So I would be holding a treat in front of their nose to lure them into the sit position. And then once their bottom's on the floor, I'd be rewarding them with that sit. So they need to be aware when they're on a walk that there's going to be an opportunity for them to work for a treat, basically. So make sure you've got your treats with you. So things like sit when you're outside, dead easy. Probably wouldn't ask for a lie down. Lots of dogs aren't comfortable doing a lie down outside if they feel a bit vulnerable or obviously if the weather's not brilliant. So sit is a good one to stick to. Um, Recall training as well and lead work, but they're a little bit more advanced and I probably need to spend a bit more time explaining them. So we'll leave those for now. Hi, Alice. Hello. So yeah, things like sit to start off with. And the other thing that I really like to do, which actually helps with your lead work and your recall when you do come to doing that, is just rewarding check-ins. So anytime they look back at you or look at you at any point, I will be throwing on loads of praise and then treating them for that. Because you're showing them that checking in with you is is a really good thing to do. So what that means is it'll be easier to get their attention when you want their attention. It'll be easier to get their focus back on you then. Um, and it will mean that they're less focused on all of the different distractions that are out and about. There's probably going to be less distractions, isn't there? Because there's going to be less people and other dogs, but they're still going to be there. And the fact that there's less of them might almost make them more interesting as well for some of our dogs. So we're going to have to work really hard to keep that attention coming in. Depending on your dog as well, you might need to use really high value rewards. So Things that work well are like little bits of cheese, bits of sausage, and you need them cut up about the size of your little fingernail. So it's not massive big cubes. It's tiny, tiny little bits. And if you've got a tiny puppy, grated cheese works quite well as well. Okay, so you're going to do some training on your walk and do some play on your walk as well. So play whatever your dog wants to do. For some dogs, it's tuggy. For some dogs, it's fetching a ball for some dogs it's just chasing a ball I know lots of people where the dogs really like chasing the ball they don't want to bring it back but that's fine that's their game um for some yeah they do yes 
Uh, for some people, um, chasing you is a good reward as well. Um, it's a good game for them. So you can encourage them to chase you, encourage them to come after you. It's something where they're relaxing and they're just being playful uh, and really enjoying themselves. And that gives them an opportunity to laugh a little bit of steam as well and relax a little bit. So that's another one to do is play. There's loads of other things that we can do to play with our dogs, but those are sort of the main ones that are easy to get started with. You'll only need a tuggy or a ball in your pocket. And if you're getting them to chase you, you only need you. So that's dead easy as well. And then the other thing I'm going to get you to incorporate is the last thing. So we've got do some training with them. Make sure that you're playing with them on a walk as well. I want you to do some scent work on a walk as well. Oh, nice. OK, use some of these tips, Alice. <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to, everyone will be able to watch this later. It'll just stay on the page, so you'll be able to go on and, and watch it whenever you want. So if you want to go back and look at anything, then you can do. Sorry, where was I? Right, scent work, yes. So scent work, exactly the same as what we're doing in the garden. So I would just take some treats. Again, grassy areas is good to do this. You definitely don't want to do this near the road because obviously a treat might roll into the road and you don't want your dog pulling you out into the road. So maybe park area or... Um, I do it on like grass verges and things like that as well and just chuck a little handful of maybe five or six treats onto the grass and then you can use your find it cue that you've already been practicing at home and then they can sniff around for that again that no switches on and they're sniffing so as well as going physically for the walk as well as them physically tiring themselves out by actually doing the walk they're having to work mentally because they're training they're getting some really kind of high intensity physical exercise in there with the play and they're having to use their noses as well um, in order to do some scent work. So that's what I want you to try and include in your walks. Make sure in each walk there's some training, some play and some scent work. Uh, I've just thought of something with regards to the play. Obviously, if your puppy's under six months or for some larger breeds under 12 months, you just need to be careful with the intensity of the play. So you don't want to be like tugging really, really roughly with them, especially if they're teething. Uh, and you don't want to be kind of, you know, lifting them up or anything like that. Same with throwing the ball as well. You don't want lots of repetitive ball throwing if they're under the age of 12 months, because that's the kind of thing that's going to cause problems with things like hips. Uh, and elbow joints as well so obviously we want to avoid that but you can roll the ball along for them to pounce on you can throw it for them to catch there's still ways of playing it without you know getting your massive big ball flinger and kind of flinging it across the park you can you can still do things or you could throw something like a squeaky toy so it's not going to roll quite as far uh, and then you can kind of keep it a little bit shorter then can't you okay so that's making our walks count uh, and then the other thing that I was going to suggest was garden games. Now, garden games don't necessarily need to be in the garden. Again, if you've got a bit of a yard space, that would work. Or if you've got a room inside that's a decent space, you could use that. So I've been using um, my kitchen, which I'm in now, uh, because I can move the table right out of the way and it gives me a decent amount of space to do a little bit of training. Uh, my dad came a couple of weekends ago, I think it was, uh, with... Yes, squeaky tennis balls are amazing. Uh, my dad came a couple of weekends ago with his new dog, Barney, who um, some of you might have already heard about. So he's a sprocker. He's a springer cross with a cocker and he is absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Hall's a good one, especially for practicing your recall as well, Dawn. Um, so this weekend that my dad was over, I'd just taken delivery of a new tunnel for our um, puppy socialisation classes. It was quite a long tunnel. So I pushed the table to the side and I could set up the tunnel in the kitchen and do some tunnel work with him, getting him going in and out of the tunnel. Again, just for fun, just for a fun thing to do and to, to give him something to do. So, yeah, the biggest room or your garden space, you know, your biggest space for, for this sort of exercise. And your first one that I'm going to suggest is garden agility. You don't need to buy loads of equipment. I would say if you're going to buy anything in terms of agility stuff to keep you going over the next few weeks or months, it's probably a tunnel because that's the only thing that you can't really replicate out of stuff that you've got in your shed um, or in the garage or the utility room. And you can get tunnels for sort of 15, 20 quid from, you know, again, from Amazon. So I would, that's the, if you are going to buy something, you don't have to, but if you are, I think a tunnel is a, is a good thing to get. Um, I would get a shortish one that's quite wide. Sometimes when you order them, they're, they're really small and you just think, how is the dog going to fit in that? That's ridiculous. So yeah, get a decent sized one. 
And then most other things you can kind of make up yourself. Uh, yeah, a child's play tunnel would definitely work on. So long as the dog, so long as the dog could fit in it, it doesn't really matter. There's not that much difference between a dog tunnel and a child's play tunnel. To be honest, when we do our puppy classes, there are constantly children going into the play tunnels. Um, despite the fact that puppies wee in them, and we tell them that puppies wee in them, there's still kids going in because they don't care. Uh, so yeah, anything, yeah, anything like that would would be absolutely fine. And then, so other things that are really easy to make, and I've done this with Joey, um, I've done little garden agility sessions with Joey. So to make jumps, you basically just need something long, like a stick. Um, so I used garden canes. You could use the um, sort of a mop or a broom, something like that, or a washing line pole, anything that's that's long. And then I, we've got a load of bricks randomly in the corner of the garden. I just propped up bricks and I'd lay the poles on top. And that made it really safe because if he was to jump over it and knock one of them, it would just roll off. So he wasn't going to hurt himself. So you just want a pole of some kind balanced on something. So it could be balanced on two buckets. It could be bricks. It could be logs. Uh, it could even be cardboard boxes, just something like that. And if you get two or three of those, that's a nice amount to start with. You don't need to start really, really high with your jumps either. You almost need to just start so they can step over it. And especially for the young puppies, again, like I said before with your balls, you need to keep it nice and low for them because we don't want them putting any impact on their hips or on their shoulders or anything like that. So we don't want them, you know, hurting themselves. So, yes. Yes, I am looking forward to seeing videos of, of this. <laughs> so we've got our jumps, uh, we've potentially got a tunnel, um, and then weaves are fairly easy to set up as well. So you can do this one of two ways. One way you can do it is again with something like garden canes where you just kind of stab them into the lawn. You might need you know, a hammer or something like that, but just stab them into the lawn. Make sure that they're a decent distance apart. So when you watch it on TV, they're really close together and the dogs are sort of whizzing around them but your dogs can't do that yet. We need to start off easy. So I would start at a good sort of at least a foot apart and maybe just start off with three or four weaves to start off with. Um, and then you can build up from that. So you've got your weaves there. If you can't stab into the ground, just getting them to do it around like three cups on the floor. That's absolutely fine. Just something, you just need some sort of physical obstacle there. Um, and then to finish off, just get a piece of carpet or a mat or a blanket or something like that to get them to do a sit at the end of the exercise. So you've got four stations now in your garden or in your living room. So you can do a little bit of agility with them and you can mix and match the orders as well. So you could start with your jumps and then go through your tunnel and then do your weaves and finish sitting on the mat. And then you could change the order of them around to keep it interesting as well. Yeah, plant pots work, would work really well. Saucepans, I suppose something heavy is going to work better because then it's less likely to move, isn't it? So we usually use um, cones in training classes. But yeah, yeah, plant pots would, would be a good one, Debbie, definitely. Uh, and they're all fairly easy to teach as well. But the thing with this sort of agility is you're not doing it to get good at agility. You might want to get good at agility eventually, but the whole point of this exercise is to give your dog something fun to do while they're limited in terms of exercise. Um, and also to give you something nice to do with them as well, to kind of take your mind off what's going on at the moment as well. I know that when, um, when I'm sort of on a walk or when I'm focused on training with a dog, I'm not thinking about anything else that's going on. So it gives you a nice bit of a break if, you, if you're learning a new skill with your dog as well while, while this is going on. So to teach any sort of agility stuff, you want to lure them. So for your jump, you'd start off with them on one side. You'd hold a treat in front of their nose and just get them to follow the treat over the jump. So they're just stepping over it to start off with. So that's nice and easy. Uh, for your weaves, you're holding a treat in front of their nose. And you're just sh just luring them round the weaves. I might have to do a video of this actually because I'm doing it with my hands and I know you can't see it because it's down here. So you're just getting them to follow that treat going in and out of the weaves. And then with the tunnel, you're just chucking treats in to get them to go in. You never want to force them. You don't, I would be doing it all off lead. You don't want to be pulling them on a lead through a tunnel or pushing them in or pushing them over a jump or anything like that. This is meant to be fun. It's meant to be something that they're enjoying doing. We don't want to scare them whilst we're doing it. So garden gains, garden agility, 
um, is, is a really, really good one to do. Other things that you can do in the garden as well. So scent work, again, is a really good one to do. We said that before, didn't we, with the meals um, and any games as well. So play like fetch and tuggy. And again, you don't have to have a garden for this. You can do this in the living room or like Dawn said, you could do it in the hall. Halls are quite good for things like fetch because you can roll the ball down, they can go and chase it and they can pick it up and bring it back to you. And I'd be keeping any um, any play sessions or agility sessions really short as well. So 15, 20 minutes, I would probably do that and then I'd, and then I'd give them a bit of a break afterwards. Okay, so for our garden games, we've got the agility, garden agility, we've got the scent work again, and then we've got the playing with the fetch or the tuggy or whichever games they like doing. Um, so three sort of things that hopefully will be really easy for you to add into your, your daily routine with your dog, even if you are on just one walk a day or even if you can't get them out at all. You've got turning those meal times into activities three times a day. We've got really making our walks count when we are out on our walks and we've got our garden games as well. Um, and then the other thing I just thought I'd mention as well, especially because I know we've got quite a lot of young puppies in this group, is don't be afraid to use your crate for nap times as well. So one thing that's going to be really different for our dogs and our puppies, and I know a few people mentioned this to me last week, is that you're working from home and they're not necessarily used to you being around quite so much. And when you are around, they kind of expect you to be... <laughs> Hi, Brian. <laughs> When you are at home, they kind of expect you to be doing things with them. So it's quite a hard concept for them to understand that you're there, but you're busy doing something else. Same with those of you that have now got kids at home that would normally be at school. You're going to be busy with kids as well. But your puppy or your dog's going to think, you know, why aren't you, why aren't you doing something with me? I'm, you know, you're here. Surely you're here for my entertainment. So you may need to have a bit of a routine in terms of when they're going to be napping as well. So if normally you would take them out in the morning and then go to work, I would probably be trying to put them in their crate or in a room where it's nice and quiet for them to sleep at that normal time. And then if you normally pop back at lunchtime to take them out or somebody comes and takes them out for you, you could do something else then and then pop them back in the crate again then or, or in their bed. And then again in the afternoon. And then that gives you that time to get your work done, do stuff with the kids if you need to, do whatever it is that you need to do. But also it means they're getting sleep. And especially young puppies, they need a lot of sleep. We think adult dogs need about 16 hours sleep a day, which is a massive amount. So that's basically just eight hours a day, really, where we should be entertaining them. And the rest of the time they should be asleep. So we need to make sure that they're getting a good couple of hours nap in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon, a couple of hours in the evening as well, obviously before their overnight nap. And what you might find, again, this is especially if you've got young kids at home or if you've got a young dog or puppy, they're worried that they're going to miss out. So because you're there, they don't want to take themselves off to their crate and settle down. They don't want to go and have a nap because they're worried that you're going to get something fun out or you're going to do some training or you're going to get some treats out. So they'll sort of follow you around or sit staring at you, in which case they're not really resting. And what you'll find is if they're not resting, if they're following you around all day or they're like watching you all day waiting for you to do something, they're going to get really grumpy. And with older dogs, this doesn't really happen so much, but with younger dogs, it does. They get overtired in exactly the same way that kids get overtired. And you'll notice this. The worst time for this is sort of tea time, sort of any time for sort of five, six-ish onwards. So it always seems to coincide with when you're trying to cook or you're trying to eat or you're trying to get kids ready for bed or something like that. And they just go hyper and they'll start running around in circles. They'll start jumping up and biting. They'll start stealing things, chewing things that they're not supposed to chew. Um or joining the conference. <laughs> so um, if they're doing those sorts of things, you know, if you've got a dog under the age of 12 months and you're noticing that from five o'clock onwards, their behavior is really bad, you know, even normally, whether you work from home or not, if you, you know, if you're normally out at work during the day. Okay, biting and nipping. Okay, I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget. Biting and nipping. Okay, uh, yeah. So make sure if they're doing that silly behaviour and it's worse in the evenings, make sure they're getting plenty of naps during the day. Uh, the other thing that's going to be helpful while you've got the kids at home a little bit more is making sure that you're separating them as much as possible. Um, so this should help with you, Amy. So make sure that you're doing your crate training. Make sure that they're settled and they're happy in their crate. 
her and that they're happy going in their crate even if they can see you so that you can do things with the kids make sure you've got baby gates set up at different doors as well so that you can keep them separate what ideally in an ideal world you only really want your kids and your puppy together if you're 100% focused on them. You don't want your kids and your puppy together in a different room playing while you're doing something else because that's when accidents happen. Uh, That's when kids get giddy, puppies get giddy, puppies, puppies get nippy and then kids get bitten. So we want to try and make sure that there are, the puppies are with us, basically, and the kids are somewhere else, or the kids are with us and the puppies somewhere else. And that'll just make your life a lot easier. You want to manage it to make it easy for you, rather than having to constantly be battling and having to tell kids off or tell puppies off. Uh, it's just, yeah, they're all going to be on top of each other, aren't they, over the next few weeks. So it's, it is going to be really, really intense for you. But if you can get a bit of a routine going with your puppy and start to use things like crates and and baby gates, that will be really helpful. Um, Okay, right. So I think that's everything that I've written down. So we were focusing today on keeping our puppies and dogs busy at home. Um, And well, obviously while we can't walk them as much or walk them at all. And what I'm going to do is, um, I'll probably do it tomorrow now. I'm gonna put together a little bit of a help sheet with all of these notes on so that you can print it out or you can refer back to it if you're struggling for ideas and things. So the other thing that I've done is I've been putting together some videos. I've been trying to master video editing, which I'm okay with now. And I've put together um, three videos and three help sheets of ideas of things for you to be doing at home. And I'm going to, you can all have a look at that. I can, I can send you all the link for that. So one of the videos is using things like Kongs and food activity toys. One of the videos is how to make an activity toy out of something like a cardboard box. And then the other activity is a little training trick to teach them, which is called targeting. So if you, if you're looking for things to do training wise to keep them busy when you're at work or, or when you're at home, this is a, this is a nice kind of simple and easy one to teach. So what I've done is I've uploaded all those files to something called Google Classroom, which I didn't know existed until a couple of days ago. And I will put in the group, I will put the link to that so that you can all click on that and join. And then the idea is you can have a look at the videos, you can see what I mean. And then if you're happy to, you can film yourself doing these with your puppies and then you can share them to the group so we can see how they've been getting on with them as well. So after this, you'll get the notes, kind of the help sheet from today's session, plus you'll get these three videos as well uh, on Google Classroom. I've got no idea what time it is at all because I can't see the time. Okay, so it's just gone half five. Okay, Um, so I think what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is probably going to be starting your socialisation while you're in isolation. Uh, I've made a note about the biting and the nipping, Amy, as well. So I'll definitely be covering that. That's on my list to do. Other things that I want to talk about, I want to talk about things like toilet training as well, because obviously that's going to be an important one. And also how to start doing your training at home as well. I'm going to try and cover these. As I say, I'm going to go live five o'clock every day for the next seven days. We'll do, it'll probably be about this long again, sort of about half an hour. If there's anything that you think of that you really want me to cover, please let me know in the group. If there's just any questions that you've got, just let me know in the group as well. I've got loads of resources, loads of handouts, videos and things that I can send you to keep you going uh, until we can until we can talk to each other. Um, thanks for joining the group. Um, I'd love it if we can get some more people in as well. So if you know anyone who's got a puppy, it doesn't actually. Ah, oh, thanks, Amy. <laughs> um, it doesn't really matter if they're not in the area because obviously they can watch the videos from anywhere, can't they? But I wanted to kind of keep it a local sort of gossip group because you're my, you're my team, you're my guys. Um, as I say, this video, thanks Debbie, this video will be available to watch. And um, yeah, let's just keep in touch. I think that's the only way we're going to stay sane. Let's keep sharing photos of our puppies, um, photos of our dogs, videos, things like that. Um, that, yeah, it is yeah, still the same for big dogs. This yeah, Today's session doesn't just apply to puppies. It applies to all dogs, really. And I wanted to get something in place straight away that's going to make a big difference straight away. Hopefully, from doing all the stuff... Yeah, yeah, definitely, Amy. Yeah, you should be able to order one on Amazon. 
Um, if you want any um, sort of tips or on size or anything like that or make, uh, just drop me a message. I'm, I'm happy to send you some links. And that's absolutely fine. I'm more than happy to do that for you. And I've got a really good crate training help sheet as well that you might find useful. So I can send you that over. If you just drop me a message, um, then I can get some contact details for you and I can send that over to you. But hopefully, whatever age your dog is, just by putting... Ah, oh, thanks, Helen. Just by putting this all into place, that's going to really help them settle down. And you're going to notice, you will notice a difference in their behaviour because they'll be more settled and more calm just from doing all of these exercises through the day. OK, um, Joey's just come in to see me. So I don't know whether he, um, I was going to see if he wanted to say hello. Let me just turn it around so you can see if I can turn it around. No, I can't come here, Joey, so everyone can see you. Mm -hmm. There he is. There he is. Look at the camera. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. There. Okay. So Joey said hi now as well. I feel like he's not been left out now. <laughs> okay. So I will see you the same time tomorrow, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, and I will speak to you in the group as well. Okay. I hope you have a good night. <laughs> Bye. Ah, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Megan. You're welcome. You're really welcome. It's a pleasure. Bye. Ah, <laughs> ah, oh. oh, I know. He's still there, Dawn. He's still there. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>